leaks after gastric bypass. Timing is everything. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. My talk today is about leaks. I'm going to discuss the learning curve, how to prevent leaks, how to identify leaks early, how to predict a leak, and most importantly, management principles. Let's start with a few definitions. Tactical failure occurs when the anastomosis just isn't done correctly. In other words, there, there's a gap, a hole. This really should be a never event in that we should be able to inspect and test an anastomosis and ensure ourselves at the end of the case that there's no technical failures. The traditional leak occurs one, two, three days later, maybe several weeks later. We think it's related to tension on the anastomosis or poor vascular supply. And lastly, a contained leak. Contained leaks really occur um, later. Patients are stable, a uh, study is performed, um, the abdomen is benign, um, and we see what looks like a contained fluid collection. If one looks at the early presentations of laparoscopic gastric bypass, by those who championed the field back in 1994, Alan Whitgrove, Phil Schauer, Calvin Higa, and look at their initial studies that they published, the leak rate varied between two and 4%. When one looks at some of the learning curves that were published, when surgeons had their first 70 cases, the leak rates were much higher than in the next several hundred. Now, as surgeons, we've, we've thought a lot about how to prevent leaks, and, and naturally, we turn to the technique. There are several different techniques here, which are usually and commonly done. Those include the circular stapled gastrojejunostomy, the hand sewn anastomosis, uh, and a linear staple that enhance sewn closure of the enterotomy. In this study of over 5,000 patients from Germany, we see here that the circle stapled anastomosis had a 1.2% leak rate. I was actually very happy to find that and that this is my preferred uh, method for performing a Gruen-Y gastric bypass. Now many have argued in the literature that the Rue limb is important. Uh, the champions of an anti-colic approach say we need to make the surgery simple. Those who've always favored the retrocolic approach say it's a straighter line and therefore there should be less tension on the anastomosis and therefore a lower leak rate. Several studies have shown that as surgeons gain more experience in transition from the retrocolic to the anti-colic approach, their leak rates decreased. Others have shown that the retrocolic approach had lower leak rates, as in the study referenced below. One idea was to use either absorbable or non-absorbable material to buttress a staple line. Scott Sikora demonstrated in animal models that the bursting strength of an anastomosis with buttress material was actually higher and concluded that a higher uh, bursting strength would lead to lower leaks. However, other studies have shown the leak rate could actually be higher as more material is placed between the staples. The use of fiber glue has also been advocated um, in animal models and then wind showed uh, that it could decrease uh, anastomotic leaks. However, more studies needed to see if this actually is preventing uh, leaks from occurring. As robotic surgery has become more popular for bariatric surgery, some of us thought that the hand sewn anastomosis done robotically may have lower leaks. In one study by Moon in 2016, uh, the initial learning curve of robotic surgery uh, produced a 7.8% leak rate compared to laparoscopic, which was at that time 0.5. 
The key thing here, I think, is first to make sure there's no technical failures. We need to identify and prove that our anastomosis is as good as we want it to be. We can do this by inspection, visually on the laparoscopic with this uh, multiple fold magnification, or by endoscopy intraluminally. Early on, my favorite way of, of proving the anastomosis was technically complete was by passing an NG tube into the pouch, quickly uh, in, uh, inflating the um, pouch with methylene blue and saline, distending the pouch and the, and the rear limb, uh, which was occluded distally. This proved both the patency of the anastomosis and the absence of a leak or technical failure. Early in my experience with Ruwai gastric bypass between 1999 and 2002, I routinely did uh, barium swallows. Uh, you can see here the contrast study demonstrating the pouch to the anastomosis. Uh, and early in my experience with 350 cases, uh, had a 1% leak rate. Here you can see the uh, contrast um, and the gastrograph and uh, below with a small extravasation. Because the leak rate was really so low, I switched to a new method uh, using methylene blue. I placed a drain into the left upper quadrant and uh, post-operatively, I could have the patient swallow 30 cc's of saline with methylene blue to see if any uh, color uh, fluid came out of the drain. Ultimately, I abandoned both uh, gastrograph and swallows and uh, methylene blue um, swallow test as the leak rate became extraordinarily slow, uh, low. Here's another thing though. Even if you had a perfectly nice uh, gastrograph and swallow and the uh, there was no leak at the level of the pouch and the gastrojejunostomy, you can still have other locations where you can still have a leak along the cut stapled stomach, along the jejunojejunostomy, and therefore proving a negative swallow uh, does not mean you don't have a leak. So what do you need to do to sort of predict whether someone has a leak? Well, what we learned as surgeons is it becomes very important to look at clinical indicators of the patient. A heart rate greater than 120 beats per minute and a respiratory rate greater than 30. These are the two most sensitive early signs predicting a leak. When this is seen, it's not the time to run off to radiology and, um, and just hope that everything's gonna be fine. When we have a tachycardia and a tachypnea, we need to be thinking about a leak and thinking about whether we need to be in the operating room. So as I said, the major problem is that contrast studies can miss leaks. They can cause a false sense of security. Abdominal pain, low urine output, diaphoresis, fevers, chills, these are all late signs of sepsis. And if we wait until the late signs of sepsis, if we delay getting the patient into the operating room for re-expiration, well, what we find is there's gonna be longer ICU stays and a higher mortality. In fact, there's studies that show that a mortality can be as high as 38 to 50% with a leak after a Ruwai gastric bypass. So as we emphasize, the major principle here is operate early without any delays. If you need testing, get it done, but think twice before you send someone to radiology for a long wait or transfer someone downtown so a bariatric surgeon can take care of the patient. All general surgeons should be comfortable doing an exploratory laparotomy in the presence of a leak. And if we're not, and if we delay, or the cross-covering surgeon is waiting for tomorrow, I can assure you that there is a whole long list of gastric bypass lawyers just waiting to introduce themselves. So what do you do when you're in the operating room? Well, you resuscitate the patient, start some antibiotics, 
wash out the abdomen. The hole usually is not too hard to find, but if there's a problem, you can place an NG tube into the pouch, inflate it with some saline, and see where it leaks out. You can use uh, colored methylene blue if you need added assistance. Usually it's difficult unless you get back really early to put a stitch into the hole. And so most of the time what you're talking about doing, even if you do get a stitch, is to put a mental patch. Again, this is something all general surgeons should be comfortable doing. In addition to the nasogastric tube that you've placed into your pouch or past your anastomosis, you have ablate drains or JP drains that can wide, that widely and thoroughly drain the upper abdomen. The key to getting patients through this sort of septic episode is all besides supporting them is nutrition. And this is where a G-tube is very helpful. This is the time to place it. Now, now and again, uh, in the emergency room, someone will have a CAT scan and they'll be bound to have a contained leak. If their vital signs are rock stable, if their abdominal exam is totally benign, you can treat this patient conservatively. But if there's any questions, call the bariatric surgeons at an accredited program. So here's the really good news about accredited programs and, and the experience of bariatric surgeons over the last 10 years. This study uh, looked at 77,000 patients who underwent rheumatoid gastric bypass in 2015 to 2016. They had leaks, 476, but the overall leak rate is now down to 0.6% and the mortality down to 1.5%. I think this is because surgeons trained in bariatric surgery through fellowships have really keyed in I'm paying attention to the heart rate, the respiratory rate, uh, and getting back to the operating room early. So in summary, gastrointestinal leaks are rare. But these are dreaded complications of laparoscopic rheumatoid gastric bypass. Radiologic contrast evaluation may underdiagnose the leak and delays increase mortality. So any uncertainty about a leak? Re-explore, re-explore early. This is good judgment. In conclusion, negative post-operative contrast studies may give a false sense of security. Tachycardia and respiratory distress may be the two most insensitive indicators of a leak. Patients with clinical signs worrisome for a leak should undergo prompt radiographic evaluation and or prompt operative re-exploration. Thank you.